We're here with uh, Will Holman, who is the executive director of Open Works in Baltimore, an organization that uh, came online in the city, I believe in 2016, and has done some phenomenal work um, in the makerspace community and contributing to even the response um, to the PPE shortage uh, as a result of the pandemic and has been a great partner uh, for Coppin State University. Uh, good morning, how are you, Will? I'm good, thanks so much for having me, Dr. Williams. Oh, thank you for agreeing to participate in the Economic Inclusion Conference at Coppin. So I want to be able to share uh, with our participants a little bit about OpenWorks and all of the great work that you have done uh, over the years. So just tell us a little bit about OpenWorks, um, what you have done, what you do, what you have done, and maybe a little bit about the direction that you're headed in in the future. Sure. So first off, thanks for the opportunity to present today. And thanks so much for your continued partnership over the last couple of years. It's been critical to kind of pushing our work forward and establishing some strong links to um, the west side of town, which uh, we're over on the east side. So OpenWorks is a 34,000 square foot nonprofit maker space uh, located in East Baltimore, a couple blocks east of Penn Station, if any of you uh, are familiar with the train passing through Baltimore. We offer seven different fabrication workshops, sewing, electronics, 3D printing, digital media, wood shop, digital fabrication, which includes CNC routers and laser cutting, and a full metal shop, including five welding stations. On top of that, we have 115 of what we call micro studios, which are about the size of an office cubicle, and our modular workstations that you can think of as kind of manufacturing co-working space. Uh, we have a contract services shop where we make stuff for other people. And then we have some classroom space, a lobby where we can hold events and a coffee shop. What this all amounts to is a kind of interdisciplinary space that can serve education for all ages. We run programs for ages eight to, to senior adults. Um, access to fabrication equipment so you can launch manufacturing startups, make art, do prototyping, DIY projects for your house, et cetera. And then very affordable, scalable studio space so that you can help launch and grow, you know, the small business that you're in. Um, this concept's relatively new. Uh, it's been around about 20 years, but really taken off in the last five or six years around the country. So there's about three or 400 other spaces like ours around the country. And we're one of the maybe 10 or 20 uh, biggest spaces in the country. That's fantastic to have such a resource in Baltimore. And uh, you hit upon a point that I would like for you to clarify just a bit uh, for our, our audience. As you said, this, this movement is, is sort of taken off in the past five or six years. And I have to admit that prior to uh, our engagement, I was totally unfamiliar with the maker movement. How has your um, community education effort gone in terms of making people from uh, helping people come become familiar with the makerspace concept and engaging the community? How has that progressed? Yeah, so starting in 2015, when we were under development and and starting to apply for all the zoning variances and things we needed to get permitted for construction. Um, I did a lot of community outreach to the neighborhood associations and other groups around the city to present the project. Uh, and the term makerspace was, was completely unfamiliar to most people. Last year in 2020, Miriam Webster added makerspaces as, makerspace as one of their new words for the year. Um, so it's starting to kind of seep into the public consciousness, but I don't think it's anywhere near you know, if you say YMCA or you say library or rec center, which are kind of other models of shared access to resources, people are completely familiar with those things. Um, but makerspace is still kind of working its way into people's heads. How, how has uh, the movement changed since the opening of OpenWorks? Of course, 
you know, we kind of divide uh, history now into pre-pandemic, pandemic, post-pandemic. But how has uh, the makerspace uh, industry movement changed over the past five years? Well, I think from a pop culture perspective, you could kind of trace it back to 2005 when Make Magazine was first founded, because that's really the sort of uh, the only real media organ attached to the maker movement. I mean, there's things like popular science, popular mechanics, uh, you know, a whole universe of tech blogs and websites. But Make really planted a flag around this notion of, of a movement of kind of hobbyists that were interested in stuff like drones and DIY science experiments and robotics and electronics experimentation. And then all these new consumer facing technologies started to roll out in the mid aughts and into the last couple of years like Arduino and Raspberry Pi and new web-based design and programming tools so that the barrier to entry to say creating a robot just keeps dropping in terms of cost and complexity to the point where now any average person can, can kind of do it. But what started as kind of a hobbyist movement maybe 15 years ago, I think in the last five years, the real change has been into kind of a makerspace 2.0 or maker movement 2.0, which says, look, well, wait a minute, this is like a real economic development opportunity. This is a real educational opportunity. That's kind of a third way outside of, of traditional vocational school or college track education. You know, we can create um, really focused a la carte adult instruction that allows entrepreneurs and inventors um, and creative entrepreneurs the opportunity to just go in, learn exactly what they need to learn to do what they need to do to get to the next milestone in their project and then execute on it. Spaces like ours are remarkably well equipped compared to like any sort of hobbyist workshop. So again, someone can walk in off the street and have access to, you know, prototyping tools that cost 20 or $30,000. And that just didn't really exist in a widespread way four or five years ago. So there's the economic development piece, there's the education piece. And then tw what 2020 showed us is there's now this emergency response piece. Um, grassroots groups and maker spaces around the world uh, produced just over 42 million units, that's million with an M, uh, units of PPE over the course of 2020 from March to December. And that was tracked by a group called Open Source Medical Supplies. So OpenWorks participated in this. We leveraged a group of over 300 volunteers at home who had access to 3D printers to um, manufacture open source face shields for frontline workers. And from March to June of last year, we made 28,000 face shields. Um, so now we're starting to understand that, well, well, online collaboration tools, digital fabrication tools, physical space and community, when you kind of bring all those things together, well, all of a sudden you can um, pivot on a dime and, and really address critical community needs in times of crisis. You, you, you really hit upon something, and I think um, it's important for uh, those who are listening and watching to, to understand the, the relationship and the value of the relationship, uh, at least inter institutionally, between OpenWorks, Coppin, and perhaps other partners that you have. Um, we've had, I've had the benefit, we, and Coppin as an institution has had the benefit of partnering with OpenWorks. And that really came out of questions that uh, we formulated uh, for the first uh, report that was done in 2019, which was turning makerspaces into greater places. And you can go to greaterspacesandplaces.com and download uh, free of charge that report. Out of that report, um, a lot of your strengths were identified and the contribution that you're making in terms of economic impact. And it proved to be significant. And then out of that, um, you mentioned the production of PPE. We were able to capture in a case study the, uh, that whole process of producing 28,000 uh, face shields in 28 
in 56 days, I think it was, yeah, 56 days, just over to uh, 100 plus different clients. And that was quite an incredible uh, accomplishment in response to the crisis. But what do you, how can you else, can you articulate the strengths and the value of a space like OpenWorks to the community, to the economy, to the other institutions that you partner with? Yeah, well, first, just to speak um, to our partnership uh, in particular, the report you mentioned, um, turning makerspace into greater places, is the first comprehensive economic impact uh, uh, study of a makerspace ever conducted that we could find in any search of the previous literature. And this is really significant. And I don't know that a lot of people outside of, of kind of Baltimore have grasped the significance um, in that this is one, what I think is one of the pivot points around starting to think about makerspaces as something bigger than a platform for artists and hobbyists and think about them as, as thriving and vibrant places of kind of entrepreneurial and startup production, as well as kind of the maintenance of a whole nother ecosystem of businesses that may have their own space or pre-existing business, but don't have the capital to uh, acquire the tools and expertise that we make accessible. Um, and one of the key findings of that report is, is uh, at least pre-shutdown, at our peak, we were supporting uh, 55 small businesses and nonprofits that rented space here, and uh, well over 100 jobs between our own staff and the employment base of the companies that operated out of here. Um, so th that translates into millions and millions of dollars in the local economy and the local tax base. With, which in a post-industrial city like Baltimore is a really significant economic shot in the arm. And it's also really significant because the capital expense for this building was largely public dollars through a combination of federal, state, and local you know, kind of grants and loans. And so to be able to go back to those, those, those government entities and be able to prove the ROI in just three years or three and a half years at the time the report came out was really, really significant. And I hope will be a driver for expanding makerspaces into um, other places around the state, but also elsewhere in the country. You know, the majority of makerspace right now are kind of still in that small hobbyist stage, but if more of them can scale up where we can establish bigger ones that, that can produce the same results, I, I think it's a real pathway for equitable grassroots economic development that really kind of helps people at the bottom of the ladder start climbing their way up in a way that a lot of other top-down economic development doesn't um so yeah well um to continue along that thought thread of thought um how do you how do you think that government can help uh support this kind of effort what what is your your best hope in terms of um public public support of the expansion of maker spaces well to to make another historical analogy um uh, you know, 200 years ago, in, in libraries in, in America were largely membership societies where you had to pay money to access books. Books were so rare and expensive that most people didn't own any books, maybe outside the Bible, if they could even read, because literacy rates were quite low. And they struggled. That business model of kind of paying a membership to access books never worked out super great. Um, although fast forward 100 years, Andrew Carnegie built, I don't know, two, two or 300 libraries around the country and endowed them to make them free. Um, in the 1800s here in Baltimore, Enoch Pratt did the same thing. And then these, these systems, which were these library systems, which were kickstarted by private philanthropy, gradually were subsumed as a government operation. And now in almost any town or, or city in America, there is a free public library. And it, is, it may have some private dollars attached to it, but it's almost always mostly paid for by, by public funds. 
Now, I'm not necessarily saying that every makerspace needs to be government run or supported. I'm not necessarily suggesting that. What I'm suggesting is we're at the very beginning of a life cycle that's been kickstarted by private dollars, private philanthropy, or in some cases, for-profit investment. There's a multiplicity of business models and nobody's quite figured out what the most stable one is. But what we, if we learned nothing else about makerspace in 2020, it's that they provide a public good that is not quantifiable just through sort of your baseline ROI about how many businesses were started and how much tax base we were expanded. We're a critical part of making a, a 21st century society be technologically literate, uh, resilient in the face of disaster and, and economically fairer and more just. And so what I hope for from government at all levels is some recognition of kind of the public good that makerspace generate. And then from that public good um, support at a policy level um, that could include funding, but could also um, uh, uh, take a whole bunch of other forms policies that help us cooperate with uh, uh, secondary and post-secondary educational systems, you know, uh, workforce programs that recognize makerspaces, interdisciplinary nature. Um, uh, uh, folks have proposed coming out of 2020, a sort of U.S. Uh, civil manufacturing core, kind of like the civil uh, air core, where sort of at civilian volunteers could be called into action to make critical supplies when supply chains break down, like during COVID-19. So I think there's a lot of directions it could go. Um, but in the short term, I think it's more of an education thing with our, our government leaders to help them understand how much makerspace can contribute and then helping them help us scale up. Well, I hope that Coppin can be a partner in helping to make that case, uh, continue to be a partner in helping to make this that case. Thank you very much. This has been uh, incredible. And uh, we don't get to do this often enough. I think it's good to just kind of talk about uh, talk shop. So thank you very much for participating in the conference and we'll be talking soon.